The second part, uh, as I uh, told you, uh, is a part when uh, different scholars from different universities um, uh, you uh, will uh, uh, hear them all. Um, in fact, not all of them, uh, due to some some uh, 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 something that that happened. Uh, uh, but almost all of them, uh, and they are going to uh, uh, put the questions or comments or uh, ask something, uh, and that is the first step in discussing. Uh, uh, this uh, Professor Postema's book, uh, they uh, uh, they are going to develop uh, their uh, thesis <coughs> and their questions and uh, their comments uh, in in the essays that uh, uh, are going to be published afterwards. Uh, but now. Uh, 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 we are going to uh, start uh, with the question of Professor Pavchnik from uh, uh, Ljubljana Law School. Uh, he uh, is unfortunately uh, uh, not uh, um, uh, uh, not able to to join us online, uh, but uh, he prepared his question. And uh, 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 again, uh, uh, Nina uh, uh, will be so kind to uh, read that question, uh, uh, just to know that we uh, have not forgotten uh, our dear colleague, uh, Professor uh, Pavchnik. So Professor Pavchnik's question is, what degree of the certainty of norms is necessary for the preservation of the principle of trust in law? He elaborates, legal norms, however perfect and well expressed they may be, are only a result of an understanding of the law. The rule of law argument cannot require anything that is against the nature of law and against the nature of legal understanding, but it can require that the legal message contain enough elements to make possible an understanding of the contents of the message and the normative realization of the message. The legal message is arbitrary if its contents do not direct the recipient and also restrict him. It would be unrealistic to expect the meaning of a legal text to be completely clear and unambiguous. It is more realistic to require the legislature to provide such degree of certainty that will enable rational and foreseeable legal argumentation, at least at the level of legal understanding and decision-making. Laws that do not fulfill even these criteria do not correspond to the rule of law, the principle of trust in the law. One of your statements is that the rule of law represents not only a mode of governance, but also an ideal mode of association. I ask you kindly to explain to us your statement about the degree of certainty that is accordance with the principle of trust in the law. Is it, um, do you, should I respond in each case or do you want to gather them together? Uh, uh, I suggest uh, to, to listen to first uh, all, uh, all, all of participants them. and then you you make a choice uh, on uh, what you find interesting to, to answer uh, Thank you. Uh, or sure. comment. Good, good. Uh, the second uh, uh, scholar is Professor Julris Uyghur. Uh, she is professor uh, at Ankara University Law Faculty, and she is vice president of the IVR, for uh, you who are started uh, studying the law, uh, uh, an explanation. Uh, IVR is uh, International Association for Legal and Social Philosophy. Uh, and uh, 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 Professor Uyghur is vi Vice President of that uh, uh, international Association. She is also president of Tur Turkish Association of, for Legal Philosophy, 
and vice president uh, of Philosophical Association of Turkey. And uh, 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 the title, uh, uh, topic, uh, in fact, she uh, decided to uh, say about uh, is rule of law and a legal subject. Uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, Professor, uh, can we, uh, uh, Nina? Yes, do, as soon as she <coughs> speaks, she'll be on the big one. Yeah, jewelry. As, as soon as you start to, to tell us something, you will be uh, uh, at the, this great uh, screen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jasminka. Thank you also for organizing this amazing event. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to listen to Professor Postema. And uh, I impressed a lot these books and his uh, speech. Uh, I want to, uh, I would like to say, I want to share his many opinions. Uh, when I was listening to him, I have the question he said about the membership. And uh, he also says in his book, we should uh, create public spaces, and he said also in his, uh, when he was talking about university. Uh, if you are a professor at the university, you can create this place. I agree, I totally agree with him, uh, but I want to um, uh, say about that, uh, something this topic firstly, uh, in my, uh, uh, I will move my experience in, in law school at Ankara University. Uh, I always defend legal education based on ethical tools. For this, based on care ethics and or Aristotelian ethics, uh, how do we treat each other as equals? being aware of inequalities, why we are responsible each other, how do we treat each other with this sense of responsibility. Of course, this kind of education is also connected with fidelity. But I would like to stress that this is not easy. There are many barriers for this kind of uh, education and uh, uh, membership, I may say. Uh, for example, bias, prejudices, ideologies. How can we overcome these things and start to think ethical way? This is very, very uh, important questions, I think. And this is the real problem. Uh, okay, uh, I don't want to say this is impossible. It is possible, but it is not uh, very easy. And I want to learn his uh, opinion. Uh, for example, if I say my experience, uh, actually I am trying to buy a way of thinking. For this, I give many lectures at my faculty. After taking all the lectures, I give, I give many students say that we remember our humanity. But I draw your attention to the fact that this is not easy. This is not only uh, to, to, to be aware of all of the bias, prejudices, and ideologies, only one lecture. They should take many lectures, because to overcome all of them, it is not easy. This is also uh, problematic for uh, many, uh, problematic for us, I want to say. And uh, I would like to learn his opinion about that, how can we gain uh, this understanding of the membership. 
uh, and we should consider all of the barriers I want to stress first with this. Secondly, um, I would like to ask about the legal subject. Uh, actually, I am writing an article about uh, against the, to write against the legal subject. My title is like that. And then uh, I uh, found many uh, response from uh, post uh, Professor Pastama's uh, book, and he I enlightened my view in many ways. I thank you for this. Uh, and then, but this problem is, I think, how uh, we consider. Uh, legal subject as uh, what is that uh, active way we need active legal subject and the uh, professor postem also uh, mentioned his books though it is not enough to overcome arbitrary government uh, for this reason uh, he also suggests civil society organizations like that but I think uh, this also has problem uh, because uh, this problem is connected with domination and subordination. How we can overcome these things? Uh, this is also a problem. This is also a problem. And then um, in reality, we have we face many obstacles. And uh, civil society also have problems. Uh, regarding my country, uh, we can see easily dominant civil society and the other silent civil society organization. How we can overcome all of these kind of very, very different kind of subordination problem. And we can hear all of the people voice. Uh, uh, for this reason, I want to uh, say about the uh, Kafka's parable before the law. We cannot enter the law if you remember this story. And then I think connected with the rule of law, uh, this is our real problem. How can he enter the law? And then I want to learn about this topic to a professor uh, Postema's uh, ideas. Thank you again, uh, Jasminka. And Thank you. For the Thank you for this event. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah. Third in the row should be Professor Isabel Truillo uh, from Palermo. Uh, she is on the way uh, from <coughs> Canada, where she gave lectures uh, exactly on the way home. And if she managed <laughs> to come, uh, she will join us uh, online. Um, till, uh, till then, uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, announce that now uh, Professor Emeritus uh, uh, Constantinos Papageodio from National and Kapodistrian University of Athens uh, uh, will uh, uh, address uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Postema and say something, uh, ask something, or comment something. Uh, you uh, uh, will uh, have opportunity to uh, listen to him. Constantinos, the floor is yours. Sorry, I'm sorry I had to switch on the mic. Um, thank you again. So let me say, first of all, that I'm grateful to my dear colleague, uh, Yasminka Hazanbegovic for organizing this meeting of minds uh, around Jerry Postema's last book and around Jerry Postema himself, because he's, he's there as well. It's not just his book. I am disinclined to call Law's Rule the summation of his work but only for a very prosaic and egoistic reason. 
it is because I would not like Jerry to stop writing books. And in that sense, we should all be raising questions and making remarks that will force him to write more. But then the better part of myself takes over and confronts me with the unfairness of my thought and the baseness of my motives. In fact, Law's Rule is a very much posthumian book, if I may put it thus. It has all the virtues he exemplifies in other writings the beautiful, clear, and morally engaged philosophical prose, the inspiring references to historical sources, the nuanced and multifaceted approach, the wise weighing and calibration between opposing views, the richness of brilliant ideas, arguments, and insights. And with some of them, every reader of Postman's is already familiar. Now, when we think of all those generations of Jews before and after the Second World War, who remained intellectually entrapped within the confines of a rather insipid, disinfected, and normatively inert conception of rule of law, it is a joy and liberation to read uh, Postema's interpretation of this key principle and its uh, normative ramifications. Rule of law in law's rule ceases to be only a constitutional principle addressed to juries or a tool for shrewd politicians, but becomes a powerful idea that regulates the traffic of moral, political, and legal arguments on how we should understand the function of law in democratic societies and how to apply it and live with law. It is a kind of pathology of legal education uh, Guleris mentioned something in that direction, I, I sensed, in democratic societies to train future lawyers on the basis of a very thin understanding of the moral and political stakes and values as to how we conceive and apply law. Even a document like the 2004 UN Declaration regarding the rule of law uh, echoes remotely this pathology and Jerry Postima is very right in comparing the declaration's definition to a laundry list. His attitude, I take it at least as an ironical, uh, ironical comment, uh, but maybe, maybe he doesn't mean it like that. Uh, his attitude is diametrically opposed. That's for certain. The law's rule could be seen as a model kaleidoscopic analysis of a central legal principle and its importance for free democratic polities. First and foremost, it brilliantly succeeds in helping us become aware of the fact that the very idea of the rule of law, far from satisfying a reactionary law and order crusade, serves to control, limit, and as Postema keeps repeating all over through, throughout the book, temper power. The principles of sovereignty, equality, and fidelity to law are a manifestation of this central aim. It takes a lot to be a good lawyer, whatever the vantage point, to be part of the ongoing process of making, interpreting, and applying laws, and profiting as a citizen from a fair legal order. And one of the lessons of Postimian jurisprudence is exactly this. There is no one way road here, and certainly not a compartmentalized legal practice. As we all have a stake in the normative well being of our democratic polity, we owe it, so to speak, to each other and to the laws of our country. We are co responsible in holding power holders accountable, hence, fidelity. I also admire the way Postema weaves in the importance of democracy and fundamental rights to the rule of law idea. They are not merely political and morally important aspects of free polities that have to be factored in in the way we understand and administer law, but they also, and for our purposes most importantly, promise a superior grasp and function of the rule of law itself. In a sense, they appear to be rule of law's internal qualitative requirements for a society that is morally alive and alert. 
ώστε μας thorough excavation of rich normative meaning and institutional sense in the conceptual field and the surroundings of the rule of law idea is bearing fruit in many respects. But I have to finish, unfortunately. So I, I'll try to formulate my question as, as compressed as possible. Although there is so much to say and to ask about this book, I would like to bring to, to our attention, and most of all to Jerry's attention, the following concern. General Gap, maybe you're familiar with the famous Vietnamese general, uh, admired from all sides, allegedly once said, if the enemy disperses, he loses power. If he closes ranks, he loses territory. The reason I'm invoking gap here is that relying on fidelity means relying ultimately on an ideal view of social and political relations as moral relations. I fully agree that the rule of law regime very much depends on the citizenry's availability to support the project and invigilate over its fruition. But in recent decades, we have also witnessed the surge of a very divisive kind of populism in democratic politics. Whatever the explanation and the deeper reasons behind it, the fact is that a great deal of the populist rhetoric exploits a democratic vocabulary as a weapon against rule of law principles and the independence of the judiciary. Populists often claim that they represent the voice of the people, pure, unadulterated, and unmediated. They will, of course, also make false claims that they are the real children of fidelity for their society, their people, and their laws. So here it is. Don't you fear that by expanding the normative forces and meanings of the rule of law, the very idea risks losing its grip on its enemies. How can a theory of rule of law counter these claims and arrest the expansion of populism? Another way of putting it is perhaps this. How much democracy and what, what kind uh, do we have to read into the rule of law? And how much rule of law do we need to keep in order to keep democracy safe? So thank you for listening and bearing with me. Thank you, thank you, Constantinos. Thank you very much. Microphone. Uh, uh, now, uh, um, it, it will be totally uh, unpolite to give uh, the word to myself, and I'll uh, leave uh, my comment uh, uh, to the very end. And I ask um, uh, Professor Anna Dimishkovska from uh, uh, Faculty of Philosophy in Skopje to, um, uh, to join us in uh, saying uh, something about a topic uh, she decided to speak about and write about uh, afterwards. Legal argumentation and justification facing the rule of law. Anna, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank Professor Kostema for his extremely inspiring book and lecture. The previous uh, participants in the discussion for their valuable ideas that shared, they, they shared in the discussion, as well as Professor Jasminka Kasambegovic for bringing us all together to this uh, extraordinary event. Of the many incentives and for, for reflection contained in the book and in the lecture of Professor Kostima, I will single out only a few which I consider most closely related to the areas which are in the focus of my professional interest, uh, that is the logical aspects of law, especially legal uh, argumentation and justification. So the first idea is related to one of the fundamental demands for the institutional realization of the rule of law, formulated by Professor Fostema in the following way. I would like to quote again uh, this um, passage of the handout because I think it's really uh, important and it's uh, also present, of course, in the book. Uh, so uh, it is a robust legal profession that understands and is deeply committed to the rule of law. 
lawyers and judges are conservators of the law and guardians of its integrity, essential, essential intermediaries between law, citizens and the institutions and officials of government, and they play a crucial role in tempering ruling power." End of quotation. So to my mind, it resonates very deeply with the idea of the fundamental theoretical and practical uh, importance of legal reasoning and particularly judicial reasoning and justification of judicial decisions. Uh, it seems obvious that the role of judges as guardians of law and intermediaries between law, citizens and institutions of government, but also as temperers of ruling power is manifested through the way in which they decide the legal controversies and justify their decisions. According to the mm, theory of legal argumentation and justification, the main goal of the justification of judicial decisions is to demonstrate the conformity of those decisions uh, with the norms of the legal systems uh, system, as well as their compliance with the values which underlie the system. Therefore, well-founded legal justification is one of the most important rational instrument for guaranteeing legal certainty and justice as fundamental values of the legal order and above all the, the rule of law. So this, this is one of the really strong argument in my uh, opinion to continue to research into this uh, uh, area of intersection between law, argumentation theory and logic. But the second idea closely related to the first is the elaboration of different forms of threats to the rule of law also discussed in the approach of Professor Postena. Here, as it was already mentioned, we are confronted not only with different forms of um, acute threats, but also with chronic threats arising from, I quote again, various form of decay of the ethos that provides the vital lifeblood of the rule of law, end of quotation. So uh, on this point, we touch upon another vital issue related to the area of legal argumentation and its so so social importance. The fact that, unfortunately, the uh, judicial uh, decision making and argumentation can also become a source of grave attacks and threats to the very rule of law that the judicial system is designed to protect in the first place. Given that legal reasoning is primarily reasoning with principles and rules which are not applied mechanically, but applied with regard to specific situation, values and uh, societal interest, it is evident that uh, besides the adequate and reasonable use of the technique of legal justification, there can also arise instances of possible abuse. So practice shows that in certain cases an instrumentalization of, just, of justificatory mechanisms may occur through specific argumentative maneuvers. This instrumentalization, which uh, the represent, uh, representatives of Pragma Dialectic School of Argumentation, Van Emmer and, and his associates, call derailment of strategic maneuvering, arises in situation uh, when there are attempts to legitimize certain legal views uh, that protect a particular interest, economic, political, etc even at the cost of suspending the search for a just uh, and impartial outcome of the legal controversy. Professor Postema men mentioned also in uh, his lecture the, this phenomenon of using the law against the law itself, which is the definition of abuse. It is therefore a matter of the utmost theoretical and practical importance to explore the possibility of formulating a set of criteria that effectively demarcates between appropriate and inappropriate use of the means of legal justification. And this is another very important um, uh, area of research in uh, this uh, kind of study of the relationship between logic and law. And the third idea to which I would like to point out on this occasion and possible to develop it further on other occasions is Professor Postema appealing to the ancient, especially the Aristotelian concept of phronesis. Uh, in the general context of the application of law. Uh, this is uh, related clearly to the idea of law as a discipline of deliberative reasoning, which I also uh, admire and appreciate very much, uh, but also to the relation to contemporary discussions of the relation of artificial intelligence and law. As I saw several of um, announced discussion will touch upon this uh, issue, which also I think that is one of the most, uh, at least for my 
opinion, interesting uh, and novel uh, aspects uh, treated in the book of Professor Castema. So uh, uh, this thread leads us back to a very important point of Aristotle's uh, practical philosophy, this uh, famous articulation of the uh, intricate relationship between justice and equity, so Dikaya Sune and the Ikeia. So, uh, as Professor Postema said, as a philosopher, he likes very much the conceptual distinctions, and uh, it is clear that all uh, the distinctions established in the fifth book of the Nicomachean Ethic of Aristotle are really uh, uh, very uh, fruitful and relevant uh, until today. So, my guess is that these Aristotelian distinctions and the, his idea of the phronetic nature of judicial reasoning can indeed supplement a very important support for the thesis of the essentially different nature of legal from of legal intelligence and artificial intelligence but we will have to conduct further research uh, to see whether this intuition can be substantiated so uh, this is the essence of my comments not uh, real real question in fact but uh, in the end i would like to um, maybe formulate a very general uh, question in the direction that was mentioned in the end of Professor Postema's um, talk. So, uh, do you think that uh, a more, uh, a larger and stronger presence of uh, humanities, especially philosophy, uh, in the compulsory, compulsory education, not only in legal education but in education in general and in uh, even in earlier um, level of uh, education can in some way contribute to this um, revitalizing the general moral climate of the contemporary uh, society so pretty general one but <laughs> however uh, i would appreciate if you uh, comment something on it thank you very much <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now, uh, my dear colleague, Professor Mir Dragovanovic, I would like to express again, uh, he, he, uh, he is the one <coughs> who made uh, this event possible. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to thank him uh, uh, again. Uh, he uh, is going to um, say something about international uh, rule of law, uh, <coughs> but he put uh, that title under the question. So um, uh, oh, oh, the the uh, question is uh, uh, not just to uh, Professor Postema, to all of us. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Hassan Begovic. Uh, it was really great, uh, and it is still really great to have you here, Professor Postema. Uh, I already told you that uh, what you had to say in your chapter on the uh, international law is pretty much the same as I did in my uh, last book on uh, on the philosophy of international law. So I wanted to tackle this problem of international rule of law, which I did not specifically mention in the book, but I did in a couple of articles. And I also employed this uh, uh, Waldron's uh, argument uh, from which you proceed. Uh, and uh, I find it uh, unsatisfactory uh, to the extent that uh, it very easily dismantles uh, states as, as potential beneficiaries of the international rule of law. So the question is, just to put it in uh, more general terms, who should benefit from the application of the rule of law in international arena? Uh, Jeremy Waldron claims that there is no difference between international and domestic rule of law and that we should, by the end of the day, it is always individuals who benefit uh, I would like to claim that there are parts of uh, international uh, legal order uh, which uh, puts uh, uh, put states as primary beneficiaries 
of uh, international rule of law, whereas in some other cases, states, but also individuals and some other actors, like some collecti collectives, like peoples or, or national minorities, uh, which are also subjects of international law to a certain extent, uh, can benefit from international uh, rule of law. In that respect, I, I would like to uh, uh, basically begin with a, with a well-known uh, difference between the more formal and more substantive conceptions of, in, uh, mm -hmm. of rule of law. The more formal one uh, is kind of, in, in historical uh, terms, is a uh, uh, resembles this German co uh, conception of Rechtsstaat. Uh, it's more uh, related to the idea of uh, legality and uh, where, when uh, uh, transposed at the international level, it would imply curbing arbitrary power and uh, wrongful actions of, it, of various international uh, actors, including international organizations, more powerful states or group of states, and putting them under the reign of legal rules. Uh, so this would be more kind of horizontal uh, aspect of international law, the one that was uh, famously emphasized by Wolfgang Frieden as law of coexistence, so the first phase, the, 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 the basis of international law. The second conception is more substantive in nature, uh, it's more far-reaching, it goes uh, in, uh, uh, in vertical dimension, uh, it puts a limitation on the actions of various uh, actors, and I would say that in uh, this dimension we will see not only states but uh, individuals and other actors as beneficiaries of the international rule of law, and that would be the uh, the second phase, law of cooperation, or, or even uh, constitutionalization of international law, which some authors tend to argue. Uh, so when, when we take these two con conceptions, I would argue that different segments of international legal order, depending on the stage of their development, can be subjected to either more formal or more substan substantive version of rule of law principle. And just to illustrate this, I would mention uh, typical violations of rule of law at the international level and uh, the matching remedies for those violations along these two principles. So, Remedies of international legality, so this horizontal aspect, uh, would concern developing and impl implementing rules of states' responsibility for internationally wrongful acts. And this is something which International Law Commission uh, has drafted as articles on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. Uh, the second... Uh, the second uh, uh, illustration is basically sticking to uh, chapter 7 of the UN uh, Charter with respect to actions regarding threats to and breaches of the peace and acts of aggression, which we see how important it is, obviously, nowadays. But this would, for instance, uh, imply retreating from what was the practice of humanitarian intervention uh, which was done for the sake of moral good, but obviously with very dubious uh, uh, legal basis, to this newly formulated responsibility to protect doctrine, which puts everything again in, within the confines of the uh, United Nations Security Council uh, 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 framework. Whereas uh, remedies for uh, of international constitutionality, this horizontal aspect, it uh, first of all concerns the solidification of the content of Jus Cogens law, which excludes certain issues from the agenda of state street in making power, so they put a uh, very strict uh, uh, limitation, and we have unsolified list of illustrations of Jus Cogens norms like prohibitions of aggression, genocide, slavery, torture, apartheid, discrimination, crimes against humanity, but also the right of self-determination or some basic rules of international humanitarian law and it's 
just enough to see the pictures from from the current war in, in uh, uh, Israel and Gaza uh, to uh, to imagine how important this part uh, is. Then the fourth uh, uh, illustration would be the progress of the regime of international criminal responsibility for the crimes that affect humanity as a whole. Uh, obviously, the International Criminal Court came as an answer to this undeniable need for a permanent regime for the extraterritorial enforcement of core international crimes. But it's, as we know, jurisdiction is based on the principle of complementarity, which means that states has the primary responsibility for prosecuting international crimes. And finally, the fifth one is strengthening legal responsibility of international organizations at other non-state actors, which means also civil and tort uh, law liability and remedies for human rights violations by, by these very organizations, including, for instance, UN peace uh, keeping forces. We all know about a number of reports and instances of this kind of violations of those who are supposed to, to keep the peace. So, in short, that would be my comment, and I'm interested in your in your uh, kind of comment to a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Miyadrak. Now, uh, the floor is um, to Professor Ivana Tutsak. She comes from Osik, the Osik Strasmer University. Uh, faculty of Law, and uh, her uh, topic is Emergencies and the Rule of Law. Thank you, Professor Hassan Begovic. Uh, first, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to, prof to Professor Postema and to Professor Hassan Begovic for organizing uh, this event. So, my comment is focused on the issue of public health emergencies, inspired by the recent uh, experiences uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this pandemic uh, created an unprecedented uh, crisis. Uh, although the World, World Health Organization has warned of the possibility of a pandemic for years, most countries were, quote, uh, unprepared to deal with it. Uh, in his book, uh, Professor Postema wrote, uh, this is the quotation, some emergency emergencies combine extreme peril, genuine novelty, radical urgency, and a need for utmost secrecy, but many do not, and it distorts our thinking to put all emergencies into the basket with the most extreme, uh, the, end of, uh, the end of quotation. But Deming uh, approached the idea, ideal type of the state of emergency and the most extreme one. Uh, we already have uh, numerous, numerous studies on how the measures uh, to com combat the public health threat affected the constitutional framework, the constitutional values, the concept of democracy, uh, the principle of separation of powers, the rule of law, and we have these studies uh, regarding different countries. Uh, the strengthened role of the executive in relation to the legislature has been described by, some, uh, by one author as the hour of the executive. A new term began to be used, pan-democracy. The authors wrote uh, numerous articles about the marginaliza marginalization of the parliament uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Judiciary has also been uh, the target of criticism. For example, the Croatian Constitutional Court, uh, its critics uh, claimed that the court unquestioningly uh, supported the government's decision uh, in the fights against uh, COVID-19. Uh, these criticism were not unique to the Croatian Constitutional uh, Court. Uh, Signal critis criticism of the of the behavior of the judiciary uh, were noticed in many different countries. I would like to point out one decision of the Croatian Constitutional Court from the February uh, last year. This case uh, is in Croatia known as the COVID certificate in the public sector. 
In that decision, the Croatian uh, Constitutional Court stated the arguments why the executive must have the main role uh, during the pandemic. Uh, these arguments are not specific only to Croatia. These are actually very common arguments that appear uh, in legal literature. Uh, uh, in that decision, uh, Croatian Constitutional Court stated the executive branch is in its nature more operational than the legislative branch, which is more inert and slower, and whose decision-making process lasts longer than they are supposed to do, uh, than they, that is supposed to be in an emergency situation. The Constitutional Court emphasized that in special, exceptional, and unforeseeable pandemic circumstances, making relevant decisions aimed at the protection of people's health and life requires expertise and special knowledge from the broadest medical knowledge to specific epidemiological and immunolo immunological knowledge. Such decisions imply imminent and continuous urgent reactions, reaction and are hence not inherent to the legislative but to the ex executive branch of the government. It is interesting to note that the three dissenting justice, uh, justices uh, in their dissenting opinion uh, said that the majority that didn't even try, uh, it didn't even want to keep the illusion that the Croatian parliament has the decisive role uh, in fighting pandemic. Uh, about this, political scientists have been uh, warning for several decades now. Uh, this is the trend of marginalization of parliament. Uh, it, is an, uh, it is said that the parliaments no longer pass laws, but have become bodies that have a certain influence on how laws uh, are passed. So my question will be in the end, how will these processes, uh, the new dynamics of the relationship between the executive and the legislat legislature, uh, affect the concept of the role in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, now we have uh, Professor Igor Milinkovic uh, from Banja Luka, Faculty of Law. Uh, I... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hasanbegovic. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Postema for a very inspiring lecture. Uh, my comment and perhaps question is uh, related to the threats of the AI application in the field of law uh, to the rule of law. According to some authors, uh, the use of AI-based systems in the field of law can be highly beneficial. Some of them prophesied the arrival of legal singularity as a sort of panacea for all problems in the functioning of legal orders. Legal singularity as a state of absolute legal certainty as a stable and uh, complete legal order uh, capable of addressing and resolving practically all types of legal uncertainty. On the other hand, uh, some authors uh, claim that the strengthening of the role of AI in legal decision making can undermine some of the basic prerequisites of the rule of law. Uh, Professor Postema challenged the use of AI based systems as legal decision makers. I will comment just that part of his arguments. According to Professor uh, Postena, AI systems are unable to perform legal reasoning as a form of practical reason. Uh, they are also not capable for analogical reasoning. Uh, some of the aforementioned points uh, refer to the, the current level of AI development. But what if we make AI systems capable of analogical thinking and uh, more ready to respond to the specific demands of legal reasoning. I will end this brief comment. 
with a short quotation from the work Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. Professor Postema also pointed out certain certain aspects of the uh, dystopian world described in the Ishiguro's book. But the part that I consider very interesting is the dilemma expressed by the father of one of the book characters. Uh, regarding the possibility of uh, copying the human mind. Uh, I will read that part. I think I hate Capaldi because deep down, I suspect he may be right. But what he claims is true, uh, that science has not proved beyond doubt. There is nothing so unique about my daughter, nothing, nothing there. Our modern tools can't excavate, copy, transfer. So my dilemma, is even if we make AI cognitively equal or super intelligent AI does that uh, after reaching the point of singularity, uh, would AI systems be adequate replacement for human judges? Or in other words, is there anything that cannot or should not be transformed into, into algorithms? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Igor. Thank you very much. Look, we have some uh, some some problems. Uh, uh, I don't know if it is to to us or uh, your computer, uh, uh, but uh, anyhow, I I think that uh, uh, we. Uh, will have a, a better version thanks to <laughs> artificial intelligence <coughs> that could make it uh, better uh, uh, at the, uh, the end of the day. Uh, uh, now... Oh. I see that you hear part of my presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, Thank you. And now, my uh, uh, dear uh, uh, colleague and friend, Professor uh, Bojana Chuchkovic, uh, uh, she decided to uh, tell us something uh, about uh, one chapter uh, of Professor Postema's book, uh, 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 Rule of Law Beyond Borders. And uh, as some of us uh, know, uh, what is uh, in, we are very eager to uh, read, uh, uh, first to, to listen uh, to Vojana and then to, to read uh, uh, what she um, uh, has to tell us about. Vojana. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Kasambegovic. Uh, let me begin my brief remarks uh, by expressing how honored I am uh, to have the opportunity to participate in this important book symposium and to thank the esteemed Professor Postema for giving us the privilege of his presence here at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law, but also to our dear Professor Kasambegovic for gathering us this evening. As uh, someone who specializes in international law, I must admit that I uh, feel this evening like uh, uh, an intruder among legal philosophers. Uh, my contribution will, of course, focus on the last chapter of the book, entitled Rule of Law Beyond Borders. However, Professor Postema's thoughts on the rule of law beyond borders prompted me to reflect on another aspect of the international rule of law, and that is the international rule of law within borders. Um, at the outset, I must share with you a general impression of mine. I was struck by the masterful and precise manner in which the quintessence of international law is offered in this part of the book, and at the same time, the skillfulness and legerity by which the arguments of the skeptics who claim that there is no rule of law beyond borders are overturned. And as a professor of international law, I often have these skeptics among my students, and I actually draw on some of the arguments uh, that are put forward in the book, especially those relating to domestic law. 
Indeed, for most of the identified challenges that the rule of law faces beyond borders, a parallel is offered concerning domestic law. To name but a few, domestic law is used to undermine the argument of voluntary compliance with law and impunity as a failure of enforcement mechanisms. The domestic paradigm is also used in relation to the issue of conflicting judgments of international <coughs> courts and tribunals, where it is rightly argued that even in hierarchical legal systems such as domestic ones, higher courts do not preclude the possibility of conflicting judgments. I have deliberately outlined the link between international and domestic law because my comment relates to that, albeit in a different context. Indeed, the failures and malfunctions of domestic law obviously serve the purpose of taking the arguments based on the failures of its international counterpart beyond borders. But I wonder how the relationship between international and domestic law fits into considerations of the existence and credibility of the international rule of law within borders. And I do not have, of course, in mind the simplistic perception of this relationship uh, through the Moniz dualist controversy. The relationship between international and domestic law is far more complex than, than that. Instead, what I'm aiming for is the following. Uh, domestic law explicitly recognizes international law, and it gives it a specific status. All the solutions may differ, states do accept, and they integrate international law into their domestic systems. In this way, international law serves not only as a legal framework to guide state-to-state -state relations in the global sphere, meaning beyond borders, but also as a source of law that is integrated, of course, to varying degrees, into domestic law and thus within borders. As such, international sources of law are applied within domestic law, can be directly enforced by domestic courts. So, in other words, how does this internalization of international law affect the idea of the international rule of law? There appear to be two opposing lines of argument. On the one hand, the perspective based on the position of international law within domestic law can be used as an additional argument that the international legal order exists. Since, of course, the arguments concerning the lack of its normativity, resources, and enforcement mechanisms are refuted. Its normativity is not only recognized, but it is also reinforced by domestic law. It benefits from additional resources of domestic law, and it makes use of domestic uh, law mechanisms. On the other hand, however, this perspective can be used, on the contrary, to further argue that the rule of international law, at least within borders, depends on the way in which international law is positioned within domestic law. Its rule of law is thus not autonomous within borders. It exists because of and to the extent provided by domestic law. So both lines of argument require, of course, further elaboration, and there are plenty of counter-arguments to both of them. But basically, and here I conclude, what I'm aiming it is, uh, at is, uh, due to the constant extension of the competence of international law into domestic matters, some, something that you qualify in your book, stretching or overstretching with a question mark at the end of uh, the competence of international law within intrastate uh, matters. So do you think that the international rule of law and its gravity deserves further elaboration from the perspective of the rule of law, not only from the perspective of the rule of law beyond borders, but also from the perspective of its existence, normativity, effectiveness, and functionality within borders? Thank you. Thank you, Boyana, very much. Uh, now we, uh, we go again <coughs> to Athens, and uh, there uh, we have Professor Vasilis Vutakis, uh, who, is, uh, who has two uh, uh, questions. Um, uh, one concerning uh, Professor Postema's notion of membership, and another one, uh, uh, also uh, very complex, uh, uh, about uh, moral convictions of the legal professionals. Hmm.
Vasilis. Thank you, the... Professor Hassan Belgovic. Uh, let me start by thanking the University of Belgrade, and especially you, Professor Hassan Belgovic, for organizing this tempête intellectuelle, as you said, around Professor Postema's last book. Furthermore, I would like to thank Professor Postema personally for his clear and at the same time passionate, I would add, engaged lecture. Dear Professor Postema, needless to say how much I enjoyed reading Lost Rule and how convincing and inspiring I, I found your approach to the complex and the fundamental issues you deal with. There are so many important questions you raise, so many deep problems you touch upon. Let me, however, limit myself to the following two questions. The first one. In chapter four, the crucial and complicated notion of membership is circumscribed through the image of a, I quote, a kind of community in which members are bound by history, interdependency, and the deep rooted mutual regard that respects the distinctive features of each member and their ability to contribute to the whole. End of quote. My question is whether there is place for an egoist or even ill-willed citizen, for instance, a Kantian devil, in such a community. My second question. In, ch in chapter six, it is persuasively argued that, I quote, one further institution that is indispensable to the realization of the rule of law is the legal profession. It is further argued that in order to fulfill this function, a lawyer is, quote, bound to private client loyalty, pushing the client's interests within the law, of course. To that extent, the private client is entitled to a merely plausible interpretation of the law. My question is whether the integrity of a lawyer who is constantly required to offer, to offer plausible interpretation, which might run against her own legal or moral conviction, convictions, is not endangered. If the answer is yes, a further question, question that can, could be raised is whether such a lawyer is still expected to fulfill the function of the realization of the rule of law that is of a robust, robust moral ideal as you have so powerfully demonstrated. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Vasilis. <clears throat> uh, now we travel a little bit uh, uh, on north. Uh, uh, um, University of Lodge and our uh, dear colleague, Professor Bartosz Wojciechowski. Uh, 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 he uh, uh, has a comment that uh, concerning the citizens' practice of self-institutionalization. Self and uh, that problem uh, of, uh, as a concept and ideal uh, in the uh, uh, rule of law. Bartosz, the floor is yours. I don't see him. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, maybe uh, uh, he, he will appear uh, as a uh, uh, professor. Maybe he will appear as Professor Isabel Truillo. Uh, 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 anyhow, uh, uh, <coughs> we go uh, a little bit uh, uh, south uh, to Trnava. Uh, professor Thomas Gabrisch. Uh, who is professor at Ternava uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, 
um, and that does a lot of research in uh, uh, Slovakia Academy of Sciences uh, in, in field of uh, legal history and history of ideas. Uh, he... Thank you very much. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Yasmin. He's going to, to uh, uh, tell us uh, uh, to compare uh, uh, two perceptions of rule of law, a communitarian uh, versus a liberal one. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you once again to the organizers and to Professor Postema for this wonderful opportunity to discuss to meet, to raise questions, and maybe to brainstorm a little bit. And that's what I intend to do, to brainstorm. I will come a little bit back to uh, what Professor Miodrag Jovanovic has already raised, pointing to these two distinct traditional approaches to Rechtsstaat, the continental European approach to rule of law, and the common law approach to rule of law. These two concepts seem to be, or it seems to me, that they are somehow overcome and maybe mixed together, or yes, merged together in this book, because traditionally the, the common law approach was rather about the, the protection of individual in court cases, while on the other hand, the Rechtsstaat approach was rather about the protection of the individual against the, the government, the power. And what Professor Postema has done in his book is basically to uh, merging together these two approaches. But my question is rather whether it is not at the same time also a sort of overcoming the historical paradigm of protecting individual, be it in individual court cases or be it against the power, uh, be it against the administration, whether this is not a move rather towards uh, leading the, the interests of the individual and concern, considering the, the rule of law rather as a communitarian um, issue, a uh, collective problem. Uh, Professor Postema has mentioned communitarian approach uh, very briefly in the book, rather with, the, uh, with relation to uh, China and the collective societies, but I believe that um, the idea of fidelity and the relationship between the individuals in a society is a very much communitarian, or say it, Aristotelian approach. Uh, my question is whether this is not a truly communitarian, Aristotelian virtue society that is basically necessary in order to make the rule of law idea functional uh, in the today's society. And of course, on one hand, we can try to solve the problem by uh, sticking to the values, the societal values, community values, just like the neo-constitutional approach is doing that in Southern Europe and in Latin America. Or maybe on the other hand, a more positivist, uh, legal positivist approach can be taken by uh, laying down all these principles and all these rules in the text of the law, like Luigi Ferraioli is suggesting, uh, an Italian author also widely read in Latin America. So the question, to put it briefly, the question is, or maybe I would like to hear some comments from Professor Postema, whether this is really not a shift in the paradigm of the rule of law from a liberal one protecting the individual uh, to the communitarian one, building the society, the community that respects the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomasz. And now, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Belgrade colleague, we are here again, not abroad, Bojan uh, Spajic, uh, who is president of the Serbian Association for Legal and <coughs> Social Philosophy, and uh, 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 plan to, to tell us something about the rule of law and uh, artificial intelligence. Then, 
Uh, thank you, Professor Hasanbegovic, and to Professor Jovanovic for organizing, and for, for, to Professor Postema for coming. It is indeed an honor to comment on a book, a recent book by Professor Postema. If I had to introduce you in one sentence, I would probably just read the title of the article of Dennis Patterson from 2016, which says, um, by the way, Postema was right. Now, the younger colleagues, the, the younger colleagues wouldn't understand this, but this is, uh, an, to say the least, an irregular occurrence in the history of philosophy and philosophy of law. For somebody to be right, and for somebody to be right in the title of another philosopher's of law paper. Now, I will indeed discuss the same topic discussed by, by my colleague, uh, whom I salute from here, Igor, um, for Professor, and start by uh, repeating, and you have all heard, that for Professor Post Postema, the rule of law is a concept constituted uh, by the legal securing of members of a community against the exercise of arbitrary power. Now, artificial intelligence is the ability of non-human artificial entities to prefer, perform cognitive and physical actions commonly associated with human intelligence and human intelligent action. This is not a definition of artificial intelligence that we find in the Gerald's work on the rule of law. In fact, we don't find a precise definition of AI at all, even if we have a chapter on AI and rule of law in Law's Rule. A definition of AI in relation to law is, however, implicitly present in the chapter on AI and the rule of law. Artificial intelligence in law entails, to my understanding, using algorithms in judicial and executive decision making and government regulation. This is perhaps why the problem of AI and rule of law is posed in somewhat, somewhat radical terms in law's rule. Postema asks, what would we lose if we were to displace the law and have AI regulating our lives. And according to Professor Postema, we would lose deliberative intelligence, the guiding function of law, legal reasoning. In short, in a world in which AI replaces law, normativity or the deliberate behavior of members of a community based on intelligently deliberated rules that serve as reasons for action would be entirely lost. We would lose the entirety of normativity. To my mind, all these and other conclusions regarding the topic rest on one common premise. Rule by law and rule by AI are mutually exclusive forms of regulation and coordination. Now, the argument somewhat mimics the framing that brought to life the idea that the rule of law is preferable to the rule of man. And analogously, the rule of law is preferable to the rule of AI, and indeed, I'm absolutely convinced by Professor Postema's conclusion. I would, in fact, much rather be subject to the rule of impersonal general rules, along with the other members of a community that I'm part of, than to the rule of Matrix, HAL 9000, Skynet, or a hallucinating chatbot of the likes of ChatGPT. But just as the idea that the rule of law displaces somehow human rule is faulty, the idea that the rule of law is strictly opposed to the rule of law, to my mind, has some serious flaws. A dilemma grounded in the reality of contemporary societies regarding AI and law is, to my mind, again, more nuanced. Current generation artificial intelligence is somewhat unwieldy. At the present state of things, it's prone to making mistakes that are internally different from human mistakes, but are externally easily subsumed under common errors, logical fallacies, and biases. These problems are not legally relevant, but as I mentioned, our current legal tools and creative analogical reasoning are more than enough to resolve the issues of allocating responsibility. A far greater problem is the regulation of AI as we go along its development and the fact that this regulation should be balanced against the value of solving issues in medicine, biology, law and society that are not solvable currently without externally augmenting human intelligence. This regulation is either moving too slowly 
without following the developments of AI, or moving too hastily by stifling all development of artificial intelligence. But in both cases, the regulation is done by means of law. In any case, it would seem that the rule of law is our current best answer to the question of how to curb negative, disadvantageous, and even dangerous potential of AI with as little a dimming uh, of its possible potential as possible. For one, companies developing large language model artificial intelligence have been working on something they call constitutional AI which is trained and employed according to a set of fundamental principles that are termed constitutions. Second, computer scientists have been speculating on the perils of artificial general intelligence, devising technical ways of protecting, the most negative, protecting us from the most negative scenarios and basing the artificial intelligence on clear rules for employing these constraints. Legal scholars have been following the developments closely, repurposing old legal tools and suggesting new ones that might do the task of regulating this new form of agency better. In total, it would seem to me that the advent of a new kind of agent arguably an agent without true intelligence, like Luciano Floridi says, uh, that is potentially a disrupting source of power in contemporary societies, doesn't endanger the value of law and its rule that Professor Postema advances, but in fact, reignite that very communal deliberation that brought about, that brought about a wide agreement in the West namely the agreement that impersonal rules are a better master than personal power. For the rest of us, who still haven't actually settled on the idea that law is a better tool for building a society than the dictate of a little more than random humans, current generation AI doesn't really look so bleak. If anything, the augmentation of human intelligence could allow for a better overview of the distribution of responsibility that are entailed by a legal system and a stricter accountability for breaches of law by power. Instead of being a nuance to the rule of law, one of the promises of AI might be that it becomes another tool for the constraint of arbitrary power. If I were a law, I would like a tool like this on my side rather than against me. It is a comment, and I hope for a comment, of course. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Boyan. Uh, and now, uh, uh, last but not the least, Nadir Ozdemir. Uh, again, uh, we go to Ankara. Uh, uh, she uh, is a professor at Ankara University Law Faculty, and uh, she uh, is going to uh, say something about the rule of law in times of crisis. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the organization and also for the uh, amazing speak, uh, speech. As I am the last person, I will try to keep it short. Uh, for me, one of the most interesting and stimulating part of the book was uh, Executive Power Leashed chapter. Uh, as Turkey has recently experienced a terrible natural disaster and followed by a time of crisis, I could, in theory, uh, ana analytically think of tempering power issue even in times of crisis. And as you have emphasized on each emergency or crisis situation is specific or unique. And you explain um, proven uh, protocols or broad principles which can still guide, but uh, still isn't it impossible to make a comparison between the rule of law situations or find the criteria in times of crisis, or is it uh, only possible to talk about good or best practices as you also did about New Zealand's pandemic law. So I would like to hear more about uh, more of your remarks on the rule of law criteria in times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Nadira. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, as I uh, told you, I'm in a, a very awkward uh, position to uh, 
uh, give the floor to, to myself uh, and uh, uh, to say uh, as a last participant uh, uh, that uh, uh, is involved in, in this event from the very beginning. Uh, and I would like to, to say something about the idea of the sovereignty of law in Professor Postema's uh, law's rule. I had had uh, the exceptional honor and privilege of reading the manuscript of law's rule before it was submitted to the Oxford University Press. At that time, uh, on the recommendation of Professor Papagiorgiou, Professor Postema and I uh, were exchanging our very first emails on the occasion on the pre-published review of the book on equality and liberty. In that exchange, I mentioned to Professor Postema, just by the way, that I have been working uh, on a still unpublished article on the rule of law conceived uh, as a precise legal concept needed today. And I got from him the manuscript. Uh, his only request was not to quote nor to refer to uh, 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 his then unpublished book. Furthermore, he sent me some other of his already published preparatory texts uh, for uh, his book, uh, uh, Law's Rule. And it is really difficult to find the right words to describe how grateful and honored but also extremely delighted I was when I uh, came across Postema's concept of the sovereignty of law in his uh, law's rule. Because for more than 30 years, I have held the view that sovereignty understood as uh, legal unlimitedness of at least highest legal power holder, be it the people itself or uh, constitutional, uh, constitutionalizing power or constitutionalized power or legislative power or constitutional court or similar constitutional controlling power or any supreme or highest court of the land or any other body or all of them on one side and not just any uh, Reichstag, but uh, Reichstag understood as the rule of law state on the other side are totally incompatible precisely because of making human rights uh, which makes its higher or its highest law possibly disrespected or jeopardized. And that is something that uh, 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 I published in Rex Theorie, Zonderhelf Yugoslavian, 1991 to 1993. I have gradually developed and checked this idea and finally uh, sharpened it with help of my former student and now my dear colleague, Professor Tanasia Marinkovic. As a definition, the rule of law is the rule of human rights law. And the, that was published uh, in Bucharest in uh, some publication uh, before the, the World Congress uh, 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 2022. Uh, the rest, I hope, uh, uh, you will uh, uh, find uh, as my further argumentation on some differences between Professor Postema and myself in the book we are preparing on this debate. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you.
is totally up to you uh, 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 to decide uh, uh, would you like to, to uh, make some comments, say something, uh, uh, answer some questions, or uh, is totally... Uh, 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 <laughs> so, so I would like to to um, recognize that fairness requires five minutes for me to respond to each of the five minutes. But that would surely disappoint everyone in this room. <laughs> I will not do that. I will not test your patience. Um, there were many, many very... Um, important questions, um, many with a, a, a considerable amount of depth, and it would require um, more than five minutes for you. I thought it, if I might just take two, two areas um, that are, they, they're somewhat related, but I want to choose them because in part, um, we have students here and I worry about education. Okay. Wonderful. Um, one question that had come up several times, three, maybe four commentators, had to do with, um, with the role of education in, um, in what I called um, um, reinvigorating the moral climate, or in a couple of cases, it was a one in one comment was, had to do with lawyers' um, integrity and and um, what they should do when their own um, moral conscience conflicts with that of um, what their employers or the like, um, their clients, um, might call for. These are extremely important concerns. Um, the, the latter one, um, I did teach um, in a law school um, along with philosophy um, for a good number of years. And um, part of my course always addressed problems of uh, professional responsibility. Um, and it was um, a theme of that concern, of, those, of that course, that part of the course. Um, a theme of it was that um, inevitably the legal profession, in a greater or lesser extent, will put practitioners at a point where there will be genuine conflicts. Conflicts with their own sense of what morality ordinarily calls for and what either the law calls for or their employers or clients would like the law to do for them. Um, and throughout those, um, dealing with each of these various kinds of conflicts, um, it was important, I think, um, it was important to me to stress how crucial maintaining one's own sense, two things, maintaining one's own sense of integrity while being um, aware of the moral complexity of life. Um, there is a way of maintaining one's um, integrity by thinking of everything when it comes to morality is very clear and very black and white. And that's just not true to reality. Um, and it's self-defeating. It's, it's self -defeating. Um, on the other hand, um, if you just stress the overall complexity of things, you're liable to descend into something like um, amoralism, relativism, it doesn't matter, apathy. Neither of those. Those are two extremes that you must resist. And so personal integrity becomes really important. That's important for you to continue to reflect on what it is that's, that's at the foundation of your values. And then see how that works out in particular cases. We have much more to talk about that. I don't have, you don't have enough patience and I don't have enough energy to talk all the way through that. Um, but there's a larger issue here. And that's the issue of um, how the, responsibilities that I talk about in terms of fidelity, how those responsibilities um, are grasped um, and not just intellectually recognized, but um, 
incorporated into one's own system of values and commitments. Um, for that, we need a structure of what's sometimes called civic education. Um, and it begins before um, law school and university. Um, it begins well before that. Um, one of the commentators, I have made <laughs> notes on it, but I can't remember now which, said, don't we need more than just one lecture? And my answer is, we need more than lectures. We need experiences. We need ways in which people can deal with problems as they come up. We need, we need ways of managing that kind of thing, but not just intellectually. These are moral problems are not intellectual problems. They're not, they're not um, word games. They're not puzzles to solve. They are dilemmas in, in which people's good and evil um, interests and concerns and one's own integrity are at stake. Um, what's important to learn is not just how to solve a problem, how to draw on the available information and bring it to bear, but what, what would a responsible person with integrity think about this? And when there are conflicts, when there are genuine conflicts where any of the options available to us will involve a degree of loss or hurt to others. What we must do is to avoid um, the, the strategy of that's not my problem because I'm a professional. One must weigh in one's soul, if you like, um, the costs, even when you make decisions that you think are the morally best one and the legally best one. So what we need in our education is not just education at the law school level, in a way that's too late, not too late maybe, but maybe too late we need it earlier, and then on um, as life gets more complicated and as our education gets more complicated, we need it earlier on, but we don't need just lectures. We need something more and deeper. The other issue raised by my dear friend Constantinos Papioriou and um, several others in different ways. There's one of those, it, it comes down to something like this. So, Postuma, if you think the rule of law really depends on the existence within a political community of an ethos of fidelity, and the ethos of fidelity depends on their, a wider moral climate in which that ethos can thrive, and if that's missing, or toxins have, have um, infected it, poisoned it, um, aren't we at a loss for the rule of law? In fact, one might say, isn't that just when we need the rule of law most? And my answer is, well, what are the alternatives? If you think of the alternatives, one proposal has always been formal institutions. They'll do the work for us. Formal institutions don't do any work for us. It's only people who populate the formal institutions that do the work. So what do we do about that? Well, we need to have them develop a sense of integrity and the like, um, and then shape what that should look like best. Um, and I'm saying that it takes the shape of fidelity, but not just that. It can't be just that, because fidelity arises from it's an ethos within the moral climate in general. So we don't have an alternative. We can put our faith in institutions. We can put our faith in political um, officials. Yes, but not solely there. It's a responsibility for all of us. And if a, if a community, if a, a culture can't sustain a sense of commitment across um, across members of the community, if it can't sustain that, then the rule of law will not be possible. Um, this picture on the top, on the front of my book is a, is a model of, is an image of the way I view the rule of law. In the middle is the core idea. It's resting on the moral foundations. 
It's tottering in its institutional realization some. It will totter unless there's something that ties them all together. You can't see it here, but there is something that ties them together. That's the moral climate. That's the moral culture. Um, and it's not as if we've got some other option. This is our option. Fidelity is our option, um, I think. And we have to pay attention, you, you, and I, and we, to build that community. It's not easy. I have no panaceas. I do think we know of certain kinds of deep threats to it. Um, radical polarization is one deep sense of distrust, um, the way in which our political officials manipulate that, we have to worry about all of that. That's our job. That's my job. But I'm getting old, so it's your job. It's your job. Thanks. Thank you. Not too much. Not too late. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your extraordinary patience. <clears throat> That's it. Shall I say something at the very end? Uh, let me thanks once again to Professor Postema. Uh, let me thank to all of you. Uh, and since you were not only patient, but uh, uh, very uh, careful in uh, following this uh, very interesting discussion, I strongly suggest that we should take a glass of wine or something else and continue this in more informal, uh, informal uh, uh, arrangement uh, in, in the faculty club. We should thank especially our uh, guests online. Uh, they cannot join us <laughs> and enjoy that wine. But I hope that we arrange something in the near future and have they uh, as a guest here in Belgrade. Uh, why not again with Professor Postema? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you all.